Aloha, and welcome to this week's episode of The Millennial Mind. I'm your host, Nicole Alexandra, and I'm mildly nauseous. There are many ways we like to approach nausea and other symptoms of stress, ranging from the homeopathic, such as peppermint and ginger, to the avoidant, binge drinking and looking at photos of cats all day. Today we'll be, we will be smothering our stress on a different platform, sound, and to soothe our nausea with her lustrous voice, we have Alyssa, a producer and singer. Alyssa is the 10th child of her Mormon family, a self-proclaimed dis disappointment and proud mother to her cat named Tiger. Now to simulate our appetite, we have Mala, a hip hop artist and ordained minister, also a combat veteran and black belt in Taekwondo. Mala indulges in veganism and collecting duck paraphernalia. By their stage names, welcome Chris Moon and Super Mala Man. Thank you for having us, Nicole. Aloha. Happy to be here. I see here. you. Aloha. So, we all met on Twitter and the internet. So why do you trust me enough to come? Well, uh, I've always had the belief that you should trust every stranger you meet on the internet. So, you know, once we met, I was like, okay, you know. That's when it was all sealed. Yeah, it was a deal. You could ask me anything, I'll do it. I actually met both of you guys separately on the internet, but I've made a lot of actually really cool friends and coincidences via the internet. So I guess that's why, I mean, like I'll pull up to somebody's house that I've never met at the first time to make music with them. And I'll just be like, I might die today, might get murdered. We'll see. And you know, I haven't gotten murdered yet. So, so far so good. Well, I think most of us don't really care if we're going to get murdered or killed. <laughs> It's 2017. It's 2017. There's no harm in that. It's going to happen some way or another. But do you have any rules or restrictions for yourself on who you're going to meet? Like, what makes a person either sketchy or too boring to hit up? I think the sketchiest thing, the number one disqualifier, is if they have more followers than me on Twitter. Right. You know? That's very suspicious, as you have around... Uh, 1,700, you know? 1,700. Yeah. What makes that suspicious? I don't know. I don't trust them. Yeah, it's like I think they're there for the clout. Yeah, yeah, what exactly. did you do? You just sell your soul. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There's a sort of hierarchy going on. Exactly. So, have you ever found yourself, I guess, catfished musically? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I actually have. Like somebody, I remember I was in New Mexico uh, for a secret government mission, but uh, I was out there and uh, this guy hit me up and he's like, "Oh man, you know." I heard you were really dope, like come through, blah, 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 we have a studio, it's gonna be great. And I get there and it was literally, like I had to hold the microphone in oh. my hand when I was recording my rap. So, I mean, the song is dope, but he did not have a studio. It was his he mom's closet. You. Yeah. The only time I was musically catfished was I did an internet collab. This is like the only internet collab that was not good. And like, it was the very, very first collab I ever made. And plus, I was like a budding producer at the time, so I was like, hmm, I want to get somebody to do a 16 on this. And I had made friends with this dude on Instagram who was like from the 76, just like you, Nicole. Oh. And yeah, so then I let him do his thing on my verse, but he like would not send me anything back. And I was like, where is it? Where is it? It was like months, and I want to drop my song already. And he was like, oh yeah, I got it tomorrow. I got it tomorrow. Finally, that right tomorrow came, and then he, he sent it to me, and it was like trash. But I posted it anyways because I really liked what I did to it. Right. So what I'm really curious about is when someone wants to collab and you pull up and they're trash, do you pull out or keep like I ended up privating going? that track. Right now I have somebody else writing a 16 for it. Sorry, Edgar. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I know now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I, I was 16, was though, so like I didn't know any better. And like you had freestyles on Instagram that were videos, so I was like, hmm, this is kind of cool. Like I thought it was going to be good. Mm. Honestly, I give him a C plus for the oh. track, so he didn't fail, but I need, a, I need a B at least. Mm. I find when people rate others in terms of appearance, it's usually out of that out of 10 scale, which really doesn't make much sense. So you say someone's a 7 out of 10. That's a 70%. That's a C. Yeah. That's passing. Wait, that's true. It's passing. That's <laughs> enough, yeah. 
but that's all, that all that matters. That's all that matters. It's good enough. I mean, you know, I go by the one I read his talent system. by the letter grading system. Letter mm -hmm. grading. His aesthetic is another. Move, it's move. a different It's story. another scale. <laughs> Why are you guys roasting this guy? I'm not roasting you. <laughs> oh, poor, poor Edgar. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's just not on my track anymore. Oh, okay. Mm. He musically it's catfished. Been privated. Me. You've been musically catfished. I think that's a line that once it's crossed, you have to set boundaries mm. and watch exactly. your trust. Has to be repercussions. Yeah. yeah. Mm. He didn't mix it. You didn't even try to audio engineer it. Disrespect. Disrespectful. So since a lot of people are like, meeting each other online, do you find that it's mostly within Hawaii or have you ever done international or national collabs? I actually have done like in like national and international collabs. They're really cool. People from the UK are really good at producing and they're really nice and they let me do my thing on it and Normally those are like strictly online, but it's also nice to do like local collabs because you actually get to meet with artists and like vibe with them in the studio and see how you guys' artist chemistry works together before making a song. It usually ends up better like when you guys are friends and shit like that, oh, and, and things like that. 100%, like I almost uh, like prefer live stuff. Like I'll make music online with people from all over, you know, Europe or whatever, but you know, there's nothing better than getting super drunk and like being face to face with an artist and like doing like musical. It's data like, moshing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, Essentially. That's exactly it. <laughs> you get your, all of your different ideas to get super drunk and mm -hmm. it all flows. Yeah, create something but beautiful. When you're finding other artists to interact with on the internet, is it easier to find someone who you can vibe with? or mm. there's like a wide selection of people out there and a lot of them might be sketchy or just plain boring or bad or trash mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are trash mm -hmm. yeah. yeah musically yeah absolutely i guess intuition <laughs> intuition <laughs> yeah i mean i think edgar was the only collab i ended up like regretting regretting but like every other collab i've done like meeting the people and stuff like that in person has been something that I was very thankful for and very humbled by. To be honest, I'll collab with anybody, anybody <laughs> on the whole internet. <laughs> I respect that. You know? I think both. Mm -hmm. I can't relate. <laughs> but that is fun because you can see, like, try different things that you're not normally doing, mm -hmm. like with the same people that you do make music with. Like, yeah. challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you see what you're actually with, good at. Um, Hawaii and the size of our community that it's hard to avoid people that you already know? Or who do you not know within this community? Yeah, it is a pretty small community. But I feel like that's a good thing because you know everybody. You deal with everybody all the time. You know who all the producers are. You know what events are going down, where the shows are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think I went to, like, three Christ Moon shows before I even actually, like, met her offline. So... Like, it, because Boys. it's a small community, like, we can be a part of each other's thing way easier. Right. And how does this play into organizing shows and booking events with such a small community? Do you feel that it's sort of the same people in a circle jerk or, <laughs> like, we're occasionally wrangling new people in mm -hmm. every few months? It's a little bit of both, honestly. Like, you do get, like, the normals to come out because they're, like, with it and they understand like how these shows go down or like how it could be like a really fun show with a lot of good energy or a really like messy show which, and everyone's like, why are we even here? Mm -hmm. But like, I think that show that I just did that you came to was like the first time I really threw a show and that turned out ended up being really good. There was like a lot of people I did not know there mm -hmm. that I didn't really get to meet or anything. But like, <sighs> definitely same circle. Also like kind of slowly breaking out getting other people involved or acknowledging the small scene that we have, which is actually pretty dope. There's like really talented people in Hawaii. Yeah. I feel particularly in the genre that you guys focus on that a lot of people are down for it here. I've been to a few like um, lesser known electronic shows mm. and those are fun. They're fun, but depressing. Mm. There's like five <laughs> people. Moshing. You go, you go to the show. The time that they say it's going to start, no one's there for like a few hours. Yeah. I mean, especially in Hawaii when like 
I haven't been to shows in other places, but I've heard yeah. like LA, the doors are shut. It's 5,000 people in there. Mm -hmm. The crowd is going to break the door down. <laughs> people are like smoking everywhere. Like, yeah, it's very and they can get away with relaxed. Um, there's one well known venue in Hawaii, the Republic. You can't lie down on the floor there when there's no one, <laughs> They're gonna, no one in the room. I was like in the back by the food, by the bar, and I just like closed my eyes for one second and then a security guard came up to me and slapped my knee with his flashlight and was like, no sleeping. <laughs> I was like, Is he for he's forcing me to turn up. Like, he's not <laughs> even gonna let me like rest for one second. I know, I do turn up though. But still, the girl was trying to catch a break. Mm. Yeah, so how do you find um, venues or shows where you can really express what you need to, especially in such a small community? Is it underground? I think it's easier as a small community because it's like, there's only so many places you can do and like all the small bands go to the same places. So everyone's like, oh, I know of that place. I went there for this other thing. Mainly Hawaiian Bryans and the Republic. I don't really like either of those places, but I'll still do it because it's like the best that Hawaii offers. One of the things that my organization for the free is actually working on is throwing more and more shows in like different places yeah. where like people don't stand or go because I mean Hawaiian Bryant's yeah. you know I that's something it. everybody does it you know mm -hmm. so like uh, we're working on an event now that's coming in May 26th um, we're going to be throwing it in a warehouse right so we're planning on having it packed just floor you know the whole floor so I don't know I feel like with how, how beautiful Hawaii is, you know, there's wedding venues, there's all kinds of different places, and we kind of stick to, you know, oh, we're going to this bar and blah, blah, performing on stage, and, you know, to the same people over and over again because it's a small island. But if we want to actually evolve the community here, then we got to do something different. So that's right. our goal. Change it up. That's true. Yeah. Especially with the size. There's town where all the things are and then mm -hmm. all the residential places around it where there's nothing really mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. And there's a lot of focus on commercial things like tourism, weddings, what most people come to Hawaii for because of the beauty. When parties are usually at night mm -hmm. in town in the same areas, I think there's a lot of places that we could use. Mm -hmm. Particularly beaches, although electricity would be... We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Solar power or something. Solar power. We'll just put it in a jar. Heat powered, sand powered, yeah. milk powered. Ooh, ooh, ooh. We're Absolutely. getting there. <laughs> so, we're going to cut to a break real soon. Shift things around. But I wanted to bring up a picture. I fell in love with someone on the internet again. And that's from the guest that wasn't able to show up today, Alexandra. I just wanted to shout her out and I'll tell a little bit about more a little bit more about her after the break. Hey everybody, uh, it's Ian, social media manager here at Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for tuning in. I'm sorry to break into your show. If you're listening on the podcast, thanks for listening, watching on YouTube. We appreciate the subscription, etc. Uh, if you are a longtime listener or viewer of Think Tech Hawaii, you would know that we are on every day five to six hours a day, basically, streaming stuff that's happening here in Hawaii that matters to everybody worldwide, basically. There's a lot of stuff that we got going on, and we're excited about many of them. 2017 is going to be really cool. But right now, I can tell you that we are on iTunes, where you can listen to all of this stuff now. We're really, really excited about how that's going. And we have just started a uh, on-the-street feature, where we take a camera out to the street and stream live to you guys out there, and getting what people in the local community out, what they want or are thinking about, and sharing that with you. Um, we're really excited about all that stuff. We're really excited about you guys watching and following us on all the social media sort of things, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Look for us, Think Tech HI. Watch us on Alelo. Thank you so much. Our, everybody here appreciates it. Hello. Think Tech HI. So we're back from the break. And in honor of our very special vegan friend, Alexandra, I'd like to just take a moment and talk about what she's done for the community. I wanted to ask her why she did it and how she did it, but I'll never know. But what she did do was look in, listen to a song from Linkin Park for 24 hours straight. She started off in her house playing them on speakers, and eventually she had to go out into the real world for school, work, 
So she brought earphones and she continued listening to the same song on repeat for 24 hours. So I don't know why she did it, but she must have been crazy. So now a clip from Christ Moon's most recent music video, Lily Koi Jam. All along you had me asking many questions Like are you loyal? Are you loving those? You steady man shy Help me to say Hold it down for me And then we can see the tension Don't you wanna love me baby? Don't you wanna love me baby? Don't you wanna love me? Shouts out Noelle Kenny. She shot Gummy that video. Main. Kanye, Kanye. Kanye featuring Kanye. <laughs> Gummy Mane. She's very, I appreciate her a lot. Very she's, talented. She's got a really Truly good eye. Talented. Yes. So I'm so glad she collabed with me. Tell us about that video and the bird. <laughs> so, me and Noelle had been trying to shoot a music video together for a minute, but like it always never fell through because she doesn't live in Hawaii. She's from Hawaii, but she lives in like San Francisco. Now Japan. She now Japan. she lives in Japan. Yeah, but so we finally like got together, and then I was like, huh. I only have I only had like one music video before this video, and I was pissed about that because I wanted to keep building my repertoire of like visuals and sound. And so like when she came home from San Francisco again, she hit me up. I was like, okay, yeah, let's build, let's work. I love the vision. And we made that music, or like we only had like two hours to shoot that mu music video. Uh, we went out to Diamond Head to shoot it. And as soon as we got out of the car, there was like this white man with a parrot. And he was trying to like get tourists to buy pictures with the parrot. He was like, oh, five dollars. And, and like all the tourists were like crowding around him. And then she came up to me, she was like, dude, that'd be so sick if we get if we could get that bird in the video and I was like I'm gonna do it so I tipped that dude to like have the bird and I feel really bad for Kanani girl shouts out to her you know she's a white man slave but aren't we all anyways no, like, yeah <laughs> but we're all parrots yeah being domesticated uh -huh. in Waikiki in Waikiki yeah we use music videos we I use know videos. literally she's beautiful though she was a really good sport she uh, bit my lip, and I was like, is she trying to Make fight me? Movie. No, but she was like trying to show me that like she loves me. And my cat does that too, so I was like, okay. There's I'm very honored. a fine line <laughs> there is. between <laughs> aggression and compassion mm. that we really got to watch out for, yeah. especially in art, oh. when we take things so sensitively and express ourselves so openly. Absolutely. True. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so for the viewers out there, there is a Twitter feed if you want to ask questions. It's at ThinkTechHI. So, the what is the cure for science? That is what is on the topic now. The cure for science. Tell us why or how we can cure science and what is this book about? Well, you see, there are no hard copies of the book right now. It's actually my best-selling book. Um, it's got over a thousand pages, um, which each one breaks down exactly how to cure science. You know, people think that science is, you know, they think it's good. You know, I disagree. I got a thousand right. pages, a thousand pages plus of why it's not good. You know, not a lot of people, especially scientists, you know, they don't really, they don't really like it. Scientists may disagree. Yeah, scientists may disagree. Nine out of ten scientists. You know, the tenth one is me, of course. But, uh, you know, it's a pretty good book. You know? And if we break that down to someone's, a grade of someone's music ability, mm -hmm. nine out of ten scientists say that science is good. Yeah. But what does that really mean? Exactly. You know, those nine, they just want, you know, they want your money. I mean, my book is free, you know. There are no download links or physical or digital copies, but it's absolutely free. Um, and go to at Supermalaman on Twitter and DM me and I'll get you a copy, maybe. So this whole concept of free art mm -hmm. and consuming music art for free, how does that play into your 
interactions with the community? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of troubling for some people because for them, uh, art itself is kind of a means to an end. It's a way to achieve money. But uh, the way we believe at For the Free is that uh, art is the result of you know, being able to work and create something from everything that you've earned and done. And so for us, the actual music aspect of it is, that's the part that we're trying to get out to people. That's the free part. You know, all the other stuff, the equipment and whatever, you know, you pay for that, but the music itself, the art, is free. It's supposed to be free. Oh. So where do you get the money for the equipment? <laughs> nah, you know, I got the it. Ducks. Oh, yeah, the duck gods, bless me, on many occasions. I'm also an ordained minister, so, you know. Right. Yeah. So, I actually how? disagree with free art, though. Right. I don't think that you should give your art away for free at all. But on the come up, it's a little bit different. Like, do you have more free space to play around with what you want to charge and how you want to charge and where you want to charge? But a lot of the times, like, it becomes overwhelming to just give out all these free ideas and free, like, I worked my whole life to be able to, or, like, I've been working my whole life and I'll still be working my whole life to be able to do these things and, like, someone just, like, gets up and decides that they want to do something and that they want my assistance on it. <sighs> You're going to have to pay for that. <laughs> I definitely agree that there's a sort of level of compensation that artists deserve, but with the things that we create, it's, again, a blurry line between are we being con compensated for what we're doing or just um, sort of donated money. I yeah. see a lot of live performances. That's a service. That's an act that should be paid for as our physical albums. That True. Can, that can be. There's like a definite purchase. purchase that's going on. But the art itself is a vessel mm -hmm. for self-exploration. And that's a lot of ideas going through both the artist and the consumer's mind. And that is like necessary, I think, for people to go out and see like actual art and like be changed within themselves from it too and allow it to affect them in their own like subjective and personal way. If it's like for a homie or something, I would definitely do free stuff. Like I don't, if, if my friends are like, oh, let's make music, I'm not like, all right, give me <laughs> money. <laughs> like, but if it's like somebody I haven't really met before, they're just like specifically approaching me to like give away what I can offer, then I'm like, all right, that's where it's gonna like, like cross the line. You I don't guess. go up to a cow and squeeze the titty. No, that's disrespect. The cow will kick you. Mm -hmm. and you have to ask the cow. You gotta ask the cow. <laughs> and a lot of the time people do not ask the cow. They mm -hmm. assume that the cow won't understand them. Mm -hmm. and, so they just and a take lot of it. the time you just need to ask. So that's all simple. you gotta do. Cow's like, have my milk. No, you never know. <laughs> the process of giving out this milk, I find it very therapeutic for both artists and consumers. So what things do you use your music to cope with or cope for? Mm. Like musical mm. subtweet, musical diss track. Well, you know, every time I get a new uh, Twitter crush, you know, I'll just start writing love songs, you know, and it helps me not slide in the DMs, you know, right away. I kind of take a step back. Deliberacy. Well, yeah, exactly. And then, once you're done writing all those love songs about a Twitter girl, DMs. you can either slide in the DMs or take a look at the work that you just made mm -hmm. and publicize it. Oh, yeah. It's a win-win. Directly to them. It's always a win-win. Yeah, exactly. Like, if they don't like you, you still created this piece of art and mm -hmm. it's out there. Get to use them as a muse real quick, you know? <laughs> Everybody wins. Except for her sometimes. Sometimes. But. What about you? Wait, what was the question again? I got lost in that tangent about your Twitter crush. <laughs> well, think about my Twitter crush. Twitter crush? Veganism. Mm. My Twitter crush is veganism. And tell me about that. Well, uh, this is a photo of turmeric juice. It's beautiful. It was spilled on the ground. It looks like a minion died. It looks like a minion died. It like was stepped on. But it was, it's actually veganism, live and in effect. It's beautiful. I'm inspired. I want to eat a potato right now. Yeah. Well, veganism, uh, something that I've been uh, getting into for the last three years, you know, 
I'm pretty prolific in the vegan community. I have a song called Level 5 Vegan, you know, very famous for it. But uh, it's important to me that uh, you don't cause any harm that you don't have to, you know. And I feel like not eating meat was like the easiest thing that I had to, to add to that, you know, that movement, so. I feel like it makes so much sense, or it does make so much sense, but you're just like, why would I eat meat if I know all of these things already? Yeah, exactly. It's like, that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, I'm going to UH right now for nutrition because I feel like the biggest thing that stops people from uh, making the choice or is that they don't know. They don't realize. They're like, oh, isn't there a protein deficiency? It's like, nah, bro. You probably eat three times more protein than you already actually nuts. need. Yeah, nuts. More nuts. nuts than you can imagine. <laughs> Almonds, walnuts, peanuts, uh, pumpkin seed, you know, I acorns. I keep those in my pocket on the all daily. The, all the, all the time. Pumpkin seeds. Uh, exactly. But as a vegan, do you feel like, particularly at this moment when rat lungworm disease is having a sort of outbreak, do you feel that you're being targeted more than usual? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, there was, there was a weird spinach in my spinach today. And I knew, like right off the bat, like this is an attempt by the dairy industry to assassinate. Do you me. think it was planted on you? Absolutely, absolutely. You know. And have you noticed before any other incidents of incidences of um, meat eaters trying to plant mm -hmm. certain unhealthy vegetables on you? All the time, all the time. Questionable broccoli, uh, questionable onions. There's there's an onion on top of the fridge right now that looks. Horrible. I don't know who put it there. I think I think we need to go get it. It's probably Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> but no, yeah. I'm actually. Oh, like right now? I'm I'm really concerned about the onion, and it seems like we're running out of time for the show. So okay. We we gotta get that onion. Right. We,